Well, hello there. I hope everyone's having a great day. Um, we're going to be talking about how to help parents who are raising kids with anxiety or OCD. And a lot of times we focus so much on our kids and how they're doing that we forget that there's so much that we can do with ourselves. And that is what my three part video series is all about. It's how to help yourself in a way that maybe you don't think about. And so I have been doing Facebook lives all week to supplement the three part video series that I have going on. And even if you haven't caught the videos yet for the three part video series, they're gonna be up all weekend. So you can catch up. I have left a link above so that you can sign up and watch those videos. They're on demand and they'll be up until Sunday. So definitely check those out. And we have been talking about how to approach our children's anxiety or OCD. So on Tuesday, we talked about our mindset. In video number one, we talk about how do we perceive our children's problems? How do we perceive their anxiety or OCD? Are we all doom and gloom? Are we so overwhelmed that we're as overwhelmed as they are? Or do we try to reframe our own thinking and work on our own self so that we can approach those issues in a more positive sort of way, which can be really hard depending on where your child is at and what is currently going on. And we also talked yesterday about your body and how your body is actually kind of like an emergency alert system. And we can really tune into our body and know when we're overwhelmed, when we have had enough, when we can hit the pause button and say, you know what, I don't think I can handle what's going on with my child right now, so I'm gonna have to take a pause and take care of myself. We talked about fostering independence and we talked about how to empower our kids to help themselves because ultimately it is their journey and when we give them the tools to help themselves, we actually not only help them in a very effective way, but we also help ourselves as well and we're more effective. So that was a big summary of what we've been doing. For those of you that have posted your ahas, I appreciate that. We are going to talk about the winner of the contest at the very end. Um, thanks for joining Donna and Lisa. It's good to see you guys here. So um, for anyone who's watched video number one or video number two, if you got something um, that you've taken away from it, please leave it in the comments below and we can share that with other people. I've seen some really good takeaways that, um, that are good reminders for me as well. So today we're going to jump into community and connection and who you're connected with and how that relationship either helps or hurts your ability to be recharged. So we're gonna go into that. I just wanna make sure that I can see comments over here. Give me a second so that I can see this live. Hopefully I can, maybe I can't. Hmm. Okay, there we are. So sometimes it's good to be able to see you live. So let's talk about who we are connected with. I'm gonna talk about, um, I'm gonna go through it systematically. We're gonna talk about um, our partner, if we have a significant other, we're gonna be talking about our children, our family, our friends, and people that we're connected to in the community. And I wanna to talk to you about how to handle negative comments or how to handle um, people who are not aligned with you so that you know how to handle that. Um, hold on a second. Hi, Lisa. Um, and Susie said, I'm depleted, tired, and lonely. This is hopeful. I appreciate that. Um, we have all been there, Susie. Uh, I think every single one of us has been to that spot where we feel lonely, isolated. We feel like nobody gets it. Nobody is having a child with these kind of anxiety or OCD issues. Um, right now it's even more isolating because we're all in our house and we don't have as much connection as maybe we used to. And our kids aren't going out as much. And so we're seeing our kids um, in a more condensed sort of way. They're not going to camp. Some of them are, but I live in Arizona and things are not going well here. And so a lot of our kids aren't going out the way that they would. We're not having vacations the way that we would. And so we're seeing more of those struggles and we're seeing a lot of the, um, the issues and that can be really overwhelming and that can be exhausting. And you have to take care of yourself in order to be able to take care of your kids. And it sounds kind of cliched, you know, put your oxygen mask on before you help your children, but it's so true. Um, I have seen this time and time again in my practice when I've seen people who have poured all of their energy to helping their kids and they forgot to help themselves. Um, welcome, Carmel. I appreciate you being here. Um, and welcome. I'm not, some, I won't see some of your names. 
So, um, oh, it's Meryl. She said, hello, Natasha. I'm thankful for you and your program. And I want to say, welcome, Meryl. Um, I think I saw that you joined the AT Parenting community. And um, I'm so excited to have you over there as well, because the AT Parenting community is like this all the time. Um, every week we get together like this and we talk through Facebook and we talk through Zoom once a month and we talk and connect and support each other. So I'm excited to, to carry on the support with some of you. All right, so let's get into this today. We're talking all about connection and community. Oh, hi, Julie. Julie had the best um, AT self-care um, aha. I really enjoyed yours. I thought it was very, very poignant and very um, uplifting. So thanks for posting that. And Donna said, um, having to navigate cancer on top of OCD, RFID, anxiety issues, it's been very hard to take care of myself. And Donna, you have been in my thoughts and prayers. Um, and I know the Donna is in the AT parenting community and just us all trying to support you and feel for what is going on with your son um, has been really hard. And I, I can imagine that self-care has been the lowest thing um, on your list of to-dos, um, being at St. Jude's and dealing with all that. But I think it's important more now than ever to take care of yourself in whatever capacity you can and and that you're able to and that's going to look for different that's going to look different for different people self-care is not just and i said i think i've said this every single video but self-care is not just about um netflix and ice cream that's nice and that is a good reset and that is a good break but it's so much more than that it's about how we think how are we approaching these things? Um, you know, even for you, Donna, going into the second round of treatment, it's like what, and I know you're a very uplifting person. And so um, and this probably doesn't have anything to do with you, but how do we approach that? What is our mindset? What's our mindset for the things that are going on in our world right now, in our global world and in our world with our children with anxiety or OCD? Um, that, that's what we wanna look at. That's, that's self-care, right? Reframing our thinking is important. So, but today we're gonna to be talking about the people around us. So I wanna start talking about first your partner. Um, for those of you that have a partner, how supportive is your partner? Um, I want you to think about, are you on the same page? So let's have people post in, in the comments if you wanna share, um, are you on the same page with your partner or do you guys see things differently? Sometimes um, this is a big issue in my practice when I work with parents because I will see, I will see parents where, one partner will downplay the anxiety or OCD and they will think that it's not that big of a deal. It will take care of itself. And that can be very, very stressful for the other partner who is winding up having to carry all the burden and um, trying to do things that maybe the therapist or the person that or whatever advice they're getting, they're trying to implement that. And maybe the partner is telling them um, that it's stupid or it's not worth it or it's not important. And so that can be really, really tricky. i um, never thought about taking care of my own mental health so I can better help my child. Thank you. Yeah, and that was from Sarah. Um, and Sarah actually also just joined the AT Parenting community, I believe. And so I wanna welcome you as well. I'm seeing some great new members coming through there. Um, and Sarah said, we see things a little differently. My husband thinks our daughter is just being over dramatic. Well, I know it's more than that. Yeah, and I think that that's, um, you're not alone in that. I feel like I feel like a lot of dads, not all dads, because I've seen it the other way as well, um, will sometimes feel like kids are being a little over dramatic. Um, so differently, my husband thinks I'm exaggerating. I think that was Meryl. Um, and Megan said, sort of on the same page, but he tends to think they should just get over it and deal with it. And the teacher in me prefers to scaffold the learning and growing. And Megan, the teacher in you is actually a good therapist in you too, because that is how we want to approach it. We want a scaffold. We want to, um, in my world, it's like hierarchy building, right? You know, one step at a time. And Kelly said, I'm seeking information and support and my husband just accepts what is happening with our daughter. And I'm seeing that as a trend a lot. Um, Julie said, it took a while to get my husband to accept that we have a son with anxiety, but he has, but he has now, so I'm relieved. Uh, now I'm worried about OCD. Oh, now I'm worried I have OCD. You know what, it's funny, Julie, is a lot of times, we discover our own issues when we're going through this journey with our kids. Um, I'm a therapist and I thought I kind of knew myself and I discovered I had intense debilitating social anxiety when I had my third child and I had it my entire life. 
So we do learn things, but that's not a negative thing. It doesn't have to be overwhelming. I think I saw that you posted that you're feeling overwhelmed. Um, it can actually be a positive thing because once I started helping myself, I was better able to help my kids. Um, they trigger my social anxiety all the time. And maybe your, your child triggers your OCD. And so getting your own help can be, can be really helpful. Um, Christina said very differently. My husband also has OCD. It's extremely hard, not on the same, most, not on the same page most of the time. And that is very hard when, when your partner has OCD. And so maybe they normalize some of that behavior and that could be very, very tricky. Um, Carmel said, my husband caters to the OCD and is critical of my not supporting fighting it. And it's critical of my not supporting it. Yeah. And I think that when you have a, a partner who is who has their own mental health issues, they will will not like the approaches that that you have to take, whether you're doing exposures or you're you're moving towards the anxiety because they can't handle that themselves or they know that that would be very upsetting for them. Um, and Stephanie said, I'm recently widowed, but my mom li lives with us. She definitely does not understand the behavioral effects of anxiety and OCD. And that's a lot of stress too, being recently widowed. And I'm sorry to hear that. And then living with a, a, a parent, your parent, and then having them not understand it can be super st stressful. Donna said, my husband is fairly okay with things, but sometimes is lost on how and what his role is in helping the boys. And and so you can see that it's a, it's a, a spectrum. You know, some people have have partners that completely don't get it and that get really upset when you try to work on it and others maybe they don't know what their role is um and at my house i feel like my husband he kind of stays out of it he's like you're the therapist you deal with it um a lot of times he tries to discipline in a very um typical sort of way and sometimes i'll be like <clears throat> you know it's it's his anxiety or it's his ocd right now and sometimes he doesn't get happy with that. You know, sometimes that can impact a relationship when they're kind of like, don't tell me what to do. Um, I'm the parent too. So um, as far as partners go, I'm just going to give you some, some tips about that. There's not a silver bullet answer. Um, I do like the book. This is totally not about anxiety and OCD, but I do like the book Hold Me Tight by um, Dr. Sue Johnson. And it's all about relationships and attachment styles and how to communicate in an effective way. So there is a, a bone on something that is actually really cool and really good to help relationships if your partner is willing. Um, even if they're not, reading that book actually is very helpful. I found it really interesting. Um, the other thing is how to get your partner maybe more educated. Now, sometimes we have partners who do not want to read. They don't want to learn with you. Maybe they don't want to go to therapy appointments. And so to what level will they be willing to learn? Um, because education, if you can get them to be educated, that's the best. So if you can invite them to a therapy session or if you can ask the therapist, hey, can we just have a session for my partner and I to get him on the right page or her on the right page? I know that that's impossible for some of you, but that can be helpful. Um, if that's not possible, even I have a podcast episode and I'll link it um, when I get off, if I remember, or if, um, you can search it on iTunes or my website. Uh, at atparentingsurvival.com. But I have a podcast that's purely just for par partners and other family members who do not get it. And I talk directly to them like this is let me explain OCD to you. And let me explain anxiety to you. I have two separate podcast episodes. I have one on anxiety and one on OCD. So um, that is an option as well. Um, Susie said my battery is dead. Uh, my battery is dead and me trying to reboot is extremely difficult to ignite. Family truly d doesn't understand and isn't helpful. Hubby does support, but we tend to have different versions. And it sounds like, Susie, you are like just done right now. You are like at a negative charge. And um, I get it because I have been there myself, even as a therapist. And so it will be try. It will be hard to reboot. And I don't know if you've seen um, the first two videos in this video series. I'd recommend you watching them because sometimes... Um, and we talked about this yesterday in the Facebook Live class, sometimes just picking one tiny goal and only focusing on that and not looking at the big picture can be really helpful. Um, when I'm overwhelmed, no matter if it's not my kids, even if I'm overwhelmed in life, I just focus on what am I doing today and see if that can help. Um, Lauren says, my husband doesn't want to read or listen to anything. He wants me to teach him everything. At least he wants you to teach him. That's actually a silver lining um, because then you can consume this information and teach it to him. At least he's open. Um, not that that's fun. <laughs> you know, and Susie said, yes, um, 
she saw that in the third increment, adding to my re reading list, reading now, Brain Lock, for Yourself. Yeah, Brain Lock is an awesome book, and that actually is very um, uplifting, and so hopefully that can help as well. Um, hi, Angela, it's good to see you. Uh, I live in a dual household as a result of divorce. It's so hard to have all sets of parents on the same page. We are learning to accept that 50% of the time anxiety will be handled differently. Um, yeah, and I agree. Um, my oldest, who's 16, is from another marriage and um, she's not going back and forth anymore, her choice, but it was like that too, Angela. It was like, we just had to let go. I had to let go of anything that was gonna happen over at that house um, and just teach her how to handle her stress and I would have to give her like a lot of independent skills and we would kind of role play. This is what you do when you're in this situation at your dad's house. Um, and so that can be super tricky. So um, yeah, the other thing that I would say so if you can slip in podcasts, that's really helpful. <laughs> um, videos, uh, I have a lot of videos on YouTube and parents, um, some dads, and it's not only dads, but disproportionately it can be. So that's why I'm saying that. Um, we'll watch a five minute YouTube video, you know, just like our kids will watch a five minute YouTube video and that's okay. So that's another method. The other thing that I have done, and this is kind of what's happened at my house, um, and it's not ideal, but life is not ideal, is... I'm like, I'm the one that handles their anxiety and OCD. And so my husband, we haven't really had this conversation about it, but it's kind of an understanding. And I think that you could actually have a conversation about it and it be more um, kind of concrete to say, um, I will handle the anxiety and OCD, but this is what I'm gonna do. And so you can't undo it, right? Because there's nothing worse than you doing an approach or using language and then your partner just comes in and undoes that. And so, he stays out of it for the most part, and I'm the one. And I'm okay with that because I would rather that than him doing a different approach and being super active in a way that I wouldn't want him to be. So sometimes that can help. Um, Susie said, how do I get my teen with OCD to motivate and take control of the challenges he faces? Uh, that's a hard part, and Susie, that may be why you're kind of burnt out, is sometimes they're not ready, and sometimes that they're just not gonna put their foot on the gas. So um, I talk a lot in my OCD class about working on trust and communication first and um, building up motivation. So a lot of it sometimes is just educating him to whatever level he's willing to be educated. I don't know how old he is, but you know, saying, hey, um, I, I've worked with parents where they'll like, they'll say, hey, you can earn whatever if you listen to brain lock. Um, I don't know how old you're, you're um, son is if he's like a teenager you can say if you listen to brain lock you can earn blah 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 you you just need to focus on education trust and communication and that might be your only goal right now um, because we can't make our kids get better sooner than they want to get better and that's frustrating um, my son doesn't work at the pace that I would like him to most of the time my eight-year-old right now does not want to do any exposures and so we go through these periods where I'm all like let's go we have the summer let's do this and my kids are like no and that can be really really challenging Lisa said, my husband who has OCD doesn't admit he has OCD, but he doesn't have a problem with me helping our daughter, thank God, but why doesn't he admit? You know, I, I think a lot of people, by the time they're in their, uh, when, by the time they're adults, they don't, they are so set in their ways, they don't want to work on their OCD. I have seen that time and time again in my practice where I'm like, the parent will say, yeah, I have OCD and I do all this, but you know, I can fake it around my child and I don't want to work on me. I just want to focus on my child. And I'm like, it's never too late to focus on yourself. It's never too late to get yourself help. Um, you can make amazing progress in a short period of time if you're motivated. And um, you know, most most people don't want to because they think their OCD keeps them safe. And to to work on their OCD feels threatening and scary. And so maybe that's what's going on um, for you, Lisa, with your partner. But the, the nice thing is that he's not getting in the way of your daughter. And I have seen that there's like a little bit of help by proxy that I had one kid and she was doing so phenomenal and her parent wasn't doing phenomenal. And she was starting to motivate her parent and saying, look, we can do exposures together. And it did start to motivate that parent to think, you know what, maybe I can get help. Like it's not, it's not too late for me. Um, going back to Susie, she said, unfortunately he doesn't touch anything. He can't feed or drink or function. He's 15. Wow, that's extreme. Yeah, and I don't know all contamination all is contaminated, even the air we breathe. Yeah, that is very extreme. And I don't know. Um, 
I can't remember if you were the one that told me that you were having some insurance problems, um, but definitely getting con connected to a treatment program uh, would be really good. And you can um, you can message me later and I could try to help find some resources for that because that's beyond anything that you can manage yourself. Um, let's see. My husband has his own anxiety he deals with. You would think it would make him more sim sympathetic, but I think but I think he accommodates. Yeah, and I've seen that. It can motivate, but I have also seen that um, they um, I, they will over accommodate because they'll be they can over empathize, and so they're kind of like um, his anxiety, and then he doesn't understand the kid's anxiety as well. Yeah, and it's weird because you would actually think that someone would be more motivated, but a lot of times it winds up hurting the child, depending on that parent, because they if they haven't dealt with their own anxiety, they want to cocoon them and their child, which gets really tricky. Um, Julie said, I'm so determined to admit mental health because my dad had a psychotic break after ignoring his anxiety and OCD his whole life. So I'm very sensitive to it. Yeah, and I, I know I am very sensitive to it as well. And I think it's great that you are, Julie, because being proactive and working on it um, is the key. My father also had a psychotic break and was really, really not well. And I just refused to have that be the story for any of my family members in my within my kids' lives. So. Okay, so that's the partner, right? So tag team responsibilities if you need to. I mean, that is that is a way to, to help. This is my role. This is what I'll do. Um, this is your role. Or try to sneak in a podcast or a YouTube video. Um, let's talk about other kids in the house. How many of you have other kids? Um, I, have, I have three of them, and they all have anxiety, and two have OCD. Um, but I know that kids don't live in a bubble, right? So they have siblings. And how do you help the other kids in the house be heard, be valued? How do you help them when it's really hard for them to be around um, their brother or sister and the stuff that's happening? Um, Susie said, what worse is affect the brother relationship? Yeah, um, that can be really tricky. So um, I have an eight-year-old, a 10-year-old, and a 16-year-old. And uh, sometimes when I'm trying to address one of my child's issues, the other child has a hard time. They feel like, why are you treating her that way? Or why is she getting that special treatment? Um, that actually has has happened with my, um, my oldest daughter when I'm treating my youngest daughter in a certain way because of her anxiety. Or my son, you know, sometimes he'll get special food because he won't eat anything. And so we're like, he can have that. And then she'll be like, why can he have that? But not me. I'm picky too. And I'm like, no, you don't have RFID. You're not picky on that level. So um, it can really impact your family. Susie said, how I help brother work on this. Um, Donna said, me. <laughs> um, Dawn said, not only does the twin torment her sister's OCD, she also takes it personally. Yeah, and I think, I can imagine, and I don't know, but I can imagine that it must even be harder for twins. We had a couple people who just joined the AT Parenting community with twins, uh, twin sets, and I find that that dynamic must be really interesting. Um, Yes, my son is 23 and my daughter is 13. My daughter has picked up on some of my son's habits. Um, and Kelly said, my daughter is 19 and has anxiety and has started exhibiting OCD symptoms. My son is 17 and is having difficulty understanding her behaviors. Um, a younger brother who's four, he's impacted on a daily basis by her behaviors and copies what she does, picky eating, repulsed by certain foods. And that can be really overwhelming too um, when you see that kind of contagious behavior. Julie said, baby girl, 18 months, she's a little superstar. Don't think she struggles with anxiety or OCD at this point, but she does need a little more focus from me. She's not speaking yet, but trying hard. That's cute. Susie, my son tells me I focus on him more than me. And I think that's a common one, but I'm just focused on the boys. It's better now because I'm focusing on Ian, but Noah has been working on things at home. He has come really far with severe extreme OCD. And you have a full plate, Donna, with multiple kids with multiple issues um, and dealing with cancer as well. I mean, that's a lot. Um, Stephanie said also gets resentful of how much attention she gets and then asks out. So let's just talk about what you do with this. And again, not to like preface every category with there's no silver bullet answer, but I think it's important to know that life is muddy and that these issues are muddy. And it's not like, oh, well, if you only just did this, your life will be so much better and you won't have that problem. It, it isn't that way, but there are things that we can do to try to soften the blow. There's things that we can do to try to be proactive um, to work on that. So uh, the first thing that I, I normally say is educate the kids 
you know, I, a lot of times we have one child who's on fire and we're putting all of our energy into educating that child on anxiety or OCD. And we forget that we need to educate the siblings and talk to them about what's going on with the brother or what's going on with the sister. So take them alone, depending on their age, but it's good to get them out of earshot of the, the child with anxiety or OCD. And I always like to do one child at a time because the dynamics are different for each kid and explain to them what that child's triggers are. Now you, um, you might have to ask for permission um, depending on how private your child is. My kids, like we're an open book. Um, they know I talk about them um, online. Uh, we talk about our issues very openly at my house. We're a pretty open book. And so it would not be weird or uncomfortable or violating for me to pull, pull, pull one of my children aside and say, you know, your brother is acting that way because he thinks this about his food, you know, and this is what's going on with him. And so we're trying to build up some empathy and understanding. Um, Lauren said, at what age would you start talking to siblings about their siblings' anxiety? It kind of depends on the sibling functioning, like their cognitive functioning. Um, but I would say preschool and older, you can talk to a child about pretty much anything. Um, it just takes some, your language would be different. Um, Susie said, my son, 14 on the spectrum, and he received all the treatment younger age. Now that the older son is struggling, he doesn't understand what to do. He doesn't want to be his brother's personal servant, which I try to discourage. Yeah, and a lot of times we have to work with our sibling, with the siblings, especially if we have a child who's not motivated. So if you have a kid who's not motivated, not in that moment ready to work on things, getting the siblings to not accommodate, to not feed the anxiety or feed the OCD is really important because especially with OCD, OCD will say, oh, my mom's not completing my OCD loop anymore. I'll get my brother or sister to do it. And so that's another treatment reason why it's really important to talk to the siblings. Um, I would recommend watching Unstuck, an OCD kids movie. Um, and you can watch that at OCD. Wait a minute. Let me see. I always forget the actual... Um, it's ocdkidsmovie.com. That's a really good one for the entire family to watch. And I recommend that because that will help the kids in the house understand what their brother or sister is going through if it's OCD. And reading anxiety books, if it's anxiety, can be really helpful. Sometimes we only read it to the child who has the issue. And we forget that we should be reading this to the sibling who's dealing with it as well. Um, so in... Um, Unstuck, an OCD kids movie, he interviews a lot of the siblings. And I like to hear the siblings talk. And also on his page, he has the sibling section where he gives resources and has videos directly for siblings. So that's a really good resource to check out. Um, okay, so a couple of other things um, that I do with my kids and I haven't done lately. Th these video series are always a good reminder for me as well. It's important to spend one-on-one -on -one time with with each child individually. And that doesn't have to mean anything fancy. It could mean that you go for a walk with one child and you spend 20, 30 minutes with them. Um, I talk in video number three about um, stacking your, your activities. And so instead of adding more pressure to your ongoing pressure and stress, you can pick an activity that you already do and bring a child with you. And so in the video, I talk about going to the grocery store. I recorded that video before coronavirus. I don't know if I would take my kids to the grocery store as a one-on-one -on -one anymore. Probably not. Um, but walking around the block at night, if, I was, if I'm trying to exercise and I say, you know, I'm just going to bring one child um, and connect with them. A lot of times we think of one-on-ones and we think of, you know, big things. We have to take them out for ice cream or go get their nails done or make this a mom and daughter date. And that really isn't the point. The point is, let me carve out some time where it's just you and I and it's alone and it's quiet and you can connect with me and you can tell me if you're having any struggles. And so that can help. Um, Susie said, unstuck an OCD website, ocdkidsmovie.com. Is that correct? Um, yes, ocdkidsmovie.com. You're, you're missing the S. It's ocdkidsmovie.com. Um, I would type, but for some reason, I don't know if me typing in here would work. No, I don't think so. And I'm not going to touch anything because I don't want to break anything. <laughs> um, yes, definitely check that out. You can rent it for $8. It's worth it. It's very helpful. Um, so also try to, um, Stephanie says, I bring mine to the groceries or takeout. Yeah, we don't realize that just running an errand and saying, do you want to come with me is is carving out one-on-one -on -one time. It does not have to be fancy. Um, lately, I've been going to swimming. We just got a pool. We live in Arizona. A lot of 
girls out here. And I will just take my eight year old and I'll say, do you want to go swim with me? And we play this weird game in the pool. And um, that's our, that's a really good bonding connecting time. We just want them to be able to feel like they have time to talk to us alone. Um, and we want to do this with our child with anxiety or OCD as well. And we don't want to talk about anxiety or OCD in the one-on-one because we want them to realize that we see them um, as a person separate from their anxiety and OCD. And that's an important thing too, is seeing them and recognizing them as something other than um, just anxiety or OCD. Don said, not sure if this is a twin thing, but I have a hard time getting my girls to not need to do things together for one on one time. It's getting better, but extended activities are impossible unless the other is busy with dad. That's kind of cute, <laughs> but you know, they want, you want to be able to form a relationship separate from them as a unit. And so I would kind of really highly encourage it. Um, even if it's for a short period of time, um, Lisa said, most of the time, it's so hard to be one-on-one -on -one time with her, always issues. Yeah, and um, sometimes it's not gonna go smoothly. So it's just, you know, even if it's a 10 minutes, and if it's not fun, and it's just, you have a strained relationship right now, then it may not be something that you pick. Um, but you might do it with the siblings, right? So that they have some time. Hi, Lisa. Okay, so that's, that's other kids. I wanna talk about friends and family, because um, we have a couple more things to talk about. So, Relatives. Let's talk about relatives. How do you handle relatives? And I, you know, video three, if you haven't done video three yet, there's this worksheet you can't, that you can fill out that talk about who depletes you, who charges you. And a lot of times I think we don't look at that. We don't look at who is charging us up and who is depleting us. We just think, well, you know what? She's my mom. So I have to be friends with her and I have to talk to her all the time. And every time I talk to her, it drains me and I feel overwhelmed. Um, it's important to start to identify who is draining your battery and who is recharging your battery. Because right now, especially like for Susie, you know, like you're in crisis mode, you're overwhelmed. You need to know who is going to be draining you and who's going to be charging you. Um, Megan said, my oldest that went through major sleep issues earlier this fall, and I do three good things every night. I recently added one to work on. So each night she tells me three things that were good during the day and one thing she thinks she needs to work on. I love that. I love that. Um, and I want to say that you, it doesn't even have to be that fancy. I mean, I think that's awesome. And I think that's wonderful. I can see some stressed parents would be like, oh my gosh, I can't do that. And it's like just being in their space alone and connecting is so good. So um, think about your family members and think about who in your family and you can, you know, jot them down. No one's going to see it, you know, <laughs> just jot it down or mentally think about it in your head. Do you have someone in your family right now that drains you, that makes you feel like a bad parent, that criticizes you, that, um, you know, that takes a while to recover? You don't have to have interactions with every family member all the time. You can start to set some healthy boundaries and that can be really helpful too. Um, Renee says she's an introvert, so alone time is what recharges me. Yeah, me too. To the point where, like, I could be alone all the time and be super happy, which is not good because I have a family. <laughs> but you might be drained by your um, your extended family. So thinking about those things and and learning to set some boundaries. If you have someone who's nasty, I've had people in my life periodically where I felt like they were so they were so nasty, and and I didn't really figure it out for a while. Um, until I would get on the phone with them and then afterwards I would feel uncomfortable and I'd feel drained and I'd feel um, I'd feel exhausted the rest of the day. Well, I'm not going to take as many phone calls. I might text them and I might just put it up on pause for a while because I want to make sure that no one depletes my battery because I need that battery fully charged for my child with anxiety or OCD or in my case, my children with anxiety and OCD. So understanding who's draining you is a really important thing. Um, Susie said, yes, I realize family members do deplete me and hubby do support and deplete at the same time. I realize that I do not have a long list. Yeah. And some of us might have a very short list of, of those that charge us up. I mean, my list of people who charge me up are very tiny because I'm an introvert already, um, like Renee. So I don't have a big list to pick from anyway. I'm very selective with who I spend my time with because I'm an introvert. And so they're going to drain me no matter what, um, people in general, drain me, <laughs> which I know that sounds kind of weird, but that's okay because I'm an introvert. But that also means that I have to protect my energy even more than the average person um, or the average extrovert because I'm going to be drained 10 times quicker. Um, Susie said, also work 
that do not comprehend. They ask, but do not really want to hear it. Yeah. And when you have employers who don't get it and they don't really want to get it, they just want you to work. That is very draining as well. And some of that we can't cut out, right? Because we need an employer probably. Um, but we can, we, there are areas that we can cut is we're not cutting people out of our lives, but we can eliminate, um, some of the stress by reducing our contact or the way that we, we communicate with them. Um, Stephanie said, my mom means well, but she's very critical and acts like children are just miniature people. My sister and BIL are the same. I'm working on just saying, okay, and moving on. And I think that's amazing that you're able to just be able to say, okay, and move on and realize that they're not going to get it. They never will get it. And really, is it your job to explain things to them if they're not going to have a really direct impact in your kids? And so that's something too, that I think people get stuck on is they want they want the validation, you know, do you want the validation? You want, you want your parents or your family members to say, yes, we know he has anxiety or OCD. That's really hard for you. We want to hear that because we're human and we want to feel heard. We want to feel understood, but there are people in our lives that are never going to get it. And you have to ask yourself, do I really need them to understand to the level that I want them to now, if they live with you? Yes. You know, if your partner lives with you, yes, he's going to have to understand it on some level because he's going to interact with your kids. He's parenting with you. If you have a grandma that's in your house, that's going to impact you. But if you have a grandma that lives across the country or sees the kids a couple of times a month, who cares if she gets anxiety or OCD? Um, now, I would care because I would get upset. But doing that work to say, I just don't have the energy to, to explain things to you because I know you're never going to get it. Lauren said, my parents really drain me and they don't agree my daughter has anxiety, which is frustrating for me since they also never acknowledge my own childhood anxiety. But my daughter loves them and they have been there for me when I need them. Like they drop everything to care for my two-year-old for three months when I went to the hospital bed rest. So I have a hard time stepping back from that relationship. And it might be something like Stephanie where you don't step back um, and maybe stepping back is the wrong term for some of those intense, close relationships, but it's you reframe your approach to them related to the anxiety. And you might say, you know, you're not going to ever see her anxiety and that's okay. I don't have the energy to convince you that she's anxious. I know she's anxious. I'm getting her help for anxiety. I just don't want to talk about it with you. And so I just want you to respect that boundary that I don't want you to tell me anything about her anxiety and I'm not going to talk to you about it. And so I'm going to take that topic off the table because it's going to drain me if I talk about it and then you tell me that um, I don't, that my daughter doesn't have anxiety and that I didn't have anxiety, which I know can be incredibly hard. So I would find that really hard. Um, Julie said, we have friends who believe all kids just manipulate. Oh, I don't know. I love these people, but I do sometimes feel drained because they can't understand that my kid is struggling and not manipulating me. That would be really, really hard for me. Um, but yeah, if you put them in that, you can compartmentalize it and you can put them in that box and say, they're not going to get it and that's okay. Um, and we're just going to, you know, go watch the movies. Well, no one's going to movies anymore, but we're just going to go do this thing with them and we're going to keep them in this bucket and we're not going to talk to them about our children. Um, a lot of people are strong enough to be able to do that, which I think is fantastic. Okay. I want to move into the last part, which is about community. Have you found a community where everyone, um, also is raising kids with anxiety or OCD? Do you have go-to friends or go-to people who get it? And so they charge you up because they are all living that life with anxiety and OCD as well. Um, and this could be any kind of community. So a lot of you are in my AT parenting community. A lot of you are in my public Facebook group. You know, there's 17,000 parents in there and they all are going through that. You want to be able to connect with people who get you so that when you are feeling, um, when you're feeling depleted and you're feeling like you need to recharge and you're feeling like you have the situation where your child is just doing this behavior and you're like, Oh my gosh, I need some help. And I don't see a therapist for two weeks or I don't even have a therapist. I need some support from people who can get it. Do you have people like that? So who do you go to? Who do you go when you're having that situation? Who do you problem solve with or vent to? Who is your go-to person? So, um, I, I do have the AT parenting community and I feel like that is a really, I created that community because parents were feeling alone and they were feeling isolated. They were having a hard time finding, um, their people because even though we're all struggling together, we all stay in our house struggling separately. And so that can be really hard. 
Um, Renee said, some friends who support but don't have personal experience, a pans and pandas groups, your group, psychologist and naturopath. Yeah, and having your team of people can be very, very helpful. And you have to ask yourself, what level of support do I want and do I need? And where can I get that? So definitely having, if you're into Facebook, which most of you are because you're watching it on some, some page of mine in Facebook, that can be a great place to normalize and feel good. Uh, I do want to also invite people to the AT Parenting community if you want extra support. I open the doors up to the community for just for this week. Um, and Renee said, or no, actually, I don't know who said oh, Stephanie. Honestly, the AT Facebook page is the only place I feel like people understand. Yeah, and that's really hard. And Susie said that me, my circle doesn't understand. And a lot of people don't. I mean, I don't really have any friends or family that that I vent to or talk to, I get charged up by these communities. I get charged up by the AT parenting community, um, by the Facebook groups, um, by the people that I work with, you know, that, that I'm helping as a therapist. So I want to share with you a little bit about the AT parenting community because it's open up just for this week. It closes on Tuesday. I open it only about four times a year. Um, I did open it up for the pandemic, but then I closed it so that people can get more support. So if you've enjoyed this three-part video series and you've um, enjoyed the, the videos, the Facebook Live videos that I've been doing, this is what we do every single week in the AT Parenting community. And um, the AT Parenting community is not just a Facebook group. Um, that's just one small component. We have a whole website that you log into and you get access to, um, I have like a video library and worksheets and there's a forum. And so people ask me advice. They have, we have ongoing conversations in the AT Parenting community forums on the website. Um, I get to know people really well and, and advise them. And a lot of them have therapists that they're working with, but it's support for them um, and it's support through the community. So a lot of times they'll post things and they'll just say, does anybody have an issue with this? How did you guys handle it? And they'll get that support. Um, and then we do group coaching calls. So once a month I do a Q and A um, and we go on Zoom and we all meet each other, which is actually very cool. And um, I've enjoyed actually opening up a support group. So we have a kids and teen support group that meets once a month. And that has been very, very fun um, to see like 40 little faces on Zoom and hear everyone supporting each other and hearing these kids and their stories and having them support each other has been amazing. So if you're interested in the AT Parenting community, you can learn more about it at atparentingcommunity.com. Um, the doors are closing on Tuesday. Um, people in the community also get um, access to one of my classes for free. They actually get about $250 worth of classes for free as a member. They just get coupon codes and they can go to my online school at atparentingsurvivalschool.com and they can get some of those classes for free. So oh, thank you, Lisa. You're so beautiful and amazing. I adore you and all you do. I appreciate that. You are nice. Um, and it sounds like Lauren's got some friends. I've been fortunate to find a friend that is really supportive and our kids have similar struggles. Having someone to talk to that is supportive and gets it has been helpful for me. And Lauren's in the AT Parenting community. I am streaming this in the community. So we've got some community members in here. Um, and I think it's important that you just find, find your help wherever it can be. Um, the beauty of the internet is that you can connect with people even if um, they're, they're not in your immediate community. We have people in there from Australia. We have quite a few people from Australia, the UK, South Africa, um, all over the world. So oh, Stephanie said, thank you for, thank you so much for your help. My pleasure. Um, can you give more info on the one-on-one -on -one sessions just for parents or kids as well? Um, so I don't do one-on-one -on -one sessions. Um, but it is available to AT, only AT Parenting Community members. I really don't want to do one-on-one -on -one sessions, but I will make myself available for people who are part of the membership um, as a perk. And so they can schedule separately and we can do a one-on-one -on -one coaching call. We do have a group coaching call that we do once a month that's part of the community. Um, and we just all join on Zoom and people can ask me any questions. And I start to really get to know people and their stories. And so... Um, I have some knowledge in how to help them. And Donna said, the community is amazing and so are you. Thank you, Donna, I appreciate that. Um, Donna has been in there for a really long time and it's been, um, you know, joined and wasn't having these issues. And then to have a crisis happen while you're in the community and have hopefully felt really supported by all these people who are just praying for you and your son and trying to support you 
is, is kind of what it's all about. So if you want to learn more, go to atparentingcommunity.com. I'd love to see you guys there. Um, I do want to let you know that the video series is going to be up. Um, and Donna said, I really need to do those Zoom calls. I know, I know you've been busy, so I know you haven't been there, but we do have one. Um, it's the first week of every month. So we're going to have one actually coming up, I think next week. So it would be very cool to see you there. Um, we are going to do the raffle. I want to tell you who won the raffle um, so that we can, so we had a raffle. Um, Kelly, so thankful that I found your Facebook group recently. I appreciate that. Um, go and watch the video series. I am going to do one more raffle. So this is a raffle that is um, that is a, a free class from my AT Parenting Survival School. Um, just reading comments. So I'm sorry I'm distracted. Susie, hopefully we can find you some support. And Carmel said, I've really benefited great from the one-on-one -on -one coaching calls with you. The Zoom meets and weekly Facebook lives are terrific too. My daughter look, looks forward to the teen support groups. Thank you, Carmel. I appreciate it. It's been, now see, Carmel's a really good example of, I really fully understand everything that's going on in her world because um, she takes advantage of the AT Parenting Community resources. And so um, I really get to know people so much more than I do in like this huge Facebook group of 17,000 people. It's just too much for me to even be able to understand and help people in a very direct way other than leaving a comment saying, here, watch this video, or here's the podcast. Um, I can really devote my time and energy in the community because it's smaller and I can really get to know people. So that was a perfect example of that. Okay, so if you watch the videos over the weekend and you post in the Facebook group using the hashtag AT Self Care, I will do one more raffle for a free $127 class. Um, and you can check out all those classes at atparentingsurvivalschool.com and see which ones you would be interested in. I have one on anxiety, I have one on OCD, I have one on social anxiety. Um, but we had a raffle and the winner of that raffle, drum roll please, is Julie Creel. Uh, probably pronouncing your last name wrong, but Julie, you won. Um, you can pick out a $127 class or if you see another one um, for free, I will message you and I will let you know. I'll just give you a coupon code so you can get access to that class for free. And if any of you are interested in getting a $127 class for free as well, um, you can watch the videos, um, sign up above. There is the bit.ly link and um, watch them over the weekend and then just post in one of these Facebook groups with the hashtag, I'll search the hashtag. I'll come back in on Tuesday and I will announce the winner. And if anyone had questions about the AT Parenting community, I will answer them at that time as well. So um, yay, Julie is here. I always like it when the person who wins is actually here. So I'll message you. Um, I really, really enjoyed your, um, your ahas. I thought they were really good. Um, Susie, so I'm really desperate, so I need to check website for family well-being. Um, and Julie said, I can't tell you how much we need this. What time will you be on on Tuesday? Ooh, that's a good question. <laughs> I hadn't really even thought about it. Um, I will be on at, how about 10 o'clock Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. Um, I'll put it in my calendar right now. So I hope that that works for people. So if you have questions about the AT Parenting community or anything else, um, come back on Tuesday, June 30th at uh, 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. I will announce the winner of the class. And Julie, actually, you get a copy of my book, too. I don't know how old your child is, but I think I did mention that you would get a copy of My Anxiety Sucks, a Teen Survival Guide book as well. So I will message you and see how old your child is. Um, it's good for like nine and up but you you did earn that as well. That was part of the price. So thank you for joining me and thanks for sticking in with me and having a conversation. I always appreciate that. And um, save your questions if you have any, check out the videos and I'll be back again Tuesday um, at 10 o'clock Pacific. Take care, bye.